<clears throat> hey, good morning. Welcome to Hobby Evolution episode number 19. Um, a lot to talk about today, which uh, going into yesterday's episode, um, hadn't had any topics to discuss. They just kind of... Um, formulate during the day thanks to social media which is where i get most of my my hobby topic ideas so today i'm going to discuss uh sand lots okay um and that was from a tweet by andy hayes and i think it was um in response to a topic discussed during the cubs broadcast on marquee network so going to talk about sand lots first i want to go over some cubs mail days from yesterday i had three packages total come in um one of which i tweeted about generated a lot of uh, response on twitter it's an advert alzale tops chrome rookie this is from uh, autograph from this year's product um this only cost me three dollars and 33 cents shipped 333 shipped. I picked this up on eBay last week. Um, and how disappointing would that be to pull a $3 autograph shipped <laughs> um, out of a $275 hobby box? That's what uh, they're running on on Blowout's uh, website, um, typically the, the lowest of uh, new wax. Uh, two autographs per hobby box, 275 bucks. You get 96 cards. Um, I did a comparison you can check out at 1millioncubs.com. Um, I ended up purchasing about $240 worth of, of retail tops chrome. I did pull two autos. Um, and you get a lot of refractors. There's a lot of bang for your buck at retail. Um, whereas one hobby box, you get two autos. They could be a $3 autograph. You get 96 cards in the 240 I spent, $35 less. Um, I uh, received about 350 cards, um, for that 240 plus the, the hits I received. So that's why I think retail right now, if you can find it is obviously the biggest bang for your buck. Also my buddy, Zach, um, I know him and his son Porter received my trade package yesterday and I received uh, a package from him. He found some eight by tens. These are super cool. 8 by 10 photos, uh, I think a relative, he said, a relative or a friend took these uh, from a game. So this would have been, it's Greg Maddox and Rick Sutcliffe. So late 80s, early 90s, these are sweet. Um, I love autographs, obviously. Uh, baseballs are kind of my number one, baseball cards, Cubs, obviously, my number one collection. Number two, signed baseballs of Cubs. And then if I run out of, of, of those things to sign, then I go the 8 by 10 route. These would look pretty sweet signed. I know Greg Maddox is a tough sign, and he's really expensive if you catch him at a show. So um, they may just go in a binder um, like that. But 8 by 10s awesome. Thank you, Zach and Porter, for those cool 8 by 10s Brews and Breaks sent me a small flat rate box. Have not opened this. This will join in a couple other unopened packages. Um, which I will get to because I did open one of them last night. I had some time. Um, and that box I did open up was a medium flat rate box filled with Cubs cards. Um, this was a box I actually purchased. I paid $30 shipped, medium flat rate, almost 3,000 Cubs cards. There were uh, 2,897 Cubs cards in the flat rate box, plus some extras, which I'll get to. Um, so that bumps my... Uh, total Cubs count to 477,084, 477,084. Um, that's counted so far. Um, I still have a large flat rate box, so probably around 3,000, 3,500 in there. Uh, I've got the small flat rate box, another few hundred, um, and then another box, which is maybe a hundred. Um, so uh, 477. 84 plus, uh, you know, a few thousand more that, uh, that I'll be counting here in the next couple days. Um, so in that flat rate box, 2,900 Cubs cards, plus I said some other cards. Um, and a lot of times in bulk trades, I will, uh, you know, sometimes cards get stuck together. Sometimes you're just pulling piles that you've sorted a couple get, you know, into the wrong team. Um, so there was actually a pretty decent stack of, uh, of non Cubs cards and no, 
Uh, they do not get counted. Obviously they're not Cubs cards. Um, and I do pull them aside. So I, I do. Yes. Every package that comes in, I do count, um, and sort through. So any of the non Cubs cards, um, they go off into the rest of these boxes behind me. Um, but sometimes it's pretty cool what I receive in the non Cubs cards, because maybe I can use them. Maybe I'm low on sorted, uh, cards of a team, um, like the Cardinals, I'm working on a big bulk trade that hopefully will take place in uh, November with a, a dealer down in St. Louis. So there were um, about six, seven Cardinals cards that uh, will go in my Cardinals box. Um, there were some former Cubs, and uh, these are always kind of cool because at some point, maybe after a million, I'll, I'll start putting together uh, former Cub player collections. So Todd Hundley, Paul Kilgus. Mitch Williams, Jeremy Burnett's, um, so former Cubs in non-Cubs uniforms, and then just a, a stack of random um, Danny Bautista of the Tigers, which actually I'm putting some Tigers together, a couple Jesse Barfield, Ron Washington, Dickie Knowles, who's another former Cub, Jim Gott of the Dodgers. So, um, so yeah, every once in a while I'll get a, a stack of non-Cubs um, in those, those bulk boxes. Uh, so that's what came in the mail yesterday. And uh, one of the topics there, there's actually been a couple topics that I want to discuss, um, but I'm going to keep it just to Sandlots today. Um, I also want to bring up this week stack sales um, versus eBay. So that's a topic I'm going to discuss this week. Um, and then another topic that just kind of came to mind last night um, was people that want to, and this is kind of on the sales end as well, um, want to turn their part-time hustle, side side hustle hobby into an actual card shop business. So I want to give my thoughts on that topic this week as well. So I'm going to keep it to one topic today, and that's on growing up playing Sandlot baseball. Andy Hayes, um, actually grew up not far from where I grew up in, in Illinois. He actually reached out to me after I posted the uh, Earl Cunningham article um, because my Earl Cunningham autograph, um, when I met him, was signed in Kiwani, Illinois at a, at a card show in, the, in 1990. Um, and Andy told me his wife grew up in Kiwani as well, and, and he grew up not far from Kiwani. Um, so he posted on Twitter last night, um, and it was actually cool. It was like a Google image, Google Earth image of uh, a, a lot in his small hometown. Um, and he's got it marked off with, you know, the the blind do German shepherd dog <laughs> roamed here. Uh, this was an old house that's been torn down. We thought was haunted. First base was this oak tree, um, et cetera. So I thought that was that was pretty cool. That was unique. And I think that came from. Um, a broadcast topic because I saw Len Casper um, tweet something similar about playing Sandlot baseball as well. Um, I wish I had a cool memory like Andy on my Sandlot growing up. We didn't play too much Sandlot baseball as a kid. Um, I grew up in a small town in Illinois. And what I remember most about my childhood and, um, going out and playing sports during the summers was uh, tackle football. We played a lot of, uh, of tackle football, backyard football. Um, my friends who actually, I went to the Earl Cunningham signing with, they had an empty lot next to their house. That was our football field. And it was kind of, it was more long than it was wide. So it made for a great um, miniature football field. I think um, one year, uh, my friend Brandon actually painted lines for a football field in that empty lot. Um, but in the fall or spring, I, I don't, whenever walnuts fall, there was a big walnut tree at the end. And I think that served as our end zone. Um, when the walnuts fell, it hurt, it hurt landing on, on hard walnuts. So, um, that was our backyard, uh, our sandlot football field was, was that yard. Um, and then there was a sidewalk on the other. So it was sidewalk end zone, walnut tree. Um, and there was actually a couple walnut trees were the end zones. And it was probably, I want to say 30 yards long, maybe 40. Um, 
it was it was a decent size for you know for a bunch of eight year olds, nine, ten year olds. It was it's a good sandlot football field. Um, we did play sandlot baseball a few times, and we we actually had a couple of different sandlots per se that I I remember playing. Um, but a lot of times we would go to we had a couple baseball diamonds at the edge of town. Um, and it's actually turned into a pretty nice complex. They've made soccer fields. They've added another baseball diamond. So I think there's three total. Um, but we would go out there and play. Um, it wasn't locked or, or gated or anything. So um, you could go out there and, you know, people would practice uh, their hitting and pitching and such. Um, so we would play there um, probably more than I remember playing sandlot baseball. But the one sandlot I do remember is, um, and it is, it was a typical Sandlot baseball field. Um, right in the center of town, there was a, a big empty lot. And it was empty because it used to home the high school um, up until the 1950s. And I, I don't know if it was a fire or if it was just old age, but um, the high school was torn down at some point in the, the might have been later on because I think it did serve as a grade school. So ignore that. But, uh, it was the high school until the fifties and until they built a new high school in town. Um, and at some point, 50s, 60s, 70s, it was torn down huge lot right in the middle of town. Um, so we would play our sandlot baseball in the late eighties, early nineties. Um, we would have some games on, on that big lot, um, in the Southwest corner of the lot, there were a few trees. There was a huge, I don't know if it's oak, maple, whatever, a huge tree. So that served as kind of the backstop home plate. Um, and that gave us, you know, so center field was, um, was the longest um, dimension. And then we would throw probably an empty 24 pack of Mountain Dew as first base um, because it was just an empty lot. So we didn't really have any, um, uh, any monuments um, within the lot to mark as bases. So we would just throw down whatever, uh, whoever's batting the team that's batting their gloves would serve as the first, second and third base bags. Home plate was, um, was that Oak tree, um, serving as the backstop. So that was my sand lot memory. We also played, uh, there was a, a big empty lot on the North side of town near the water tower, um, and it was a, a really big lot. And I think we, we used it as, as a football field as well. Um, so we would play every once in a while in that lot, but for the most part, we played, um, on the actual baseball diamonds, um, in our town, but we did have the sand lot right in the middle. And since then, I think at some point in the nineties, um, somebody purchased that lot, built a house on it. So, um, sand lot, no more. I think the trees may mark it. So that's our little monument to our sand lot, the, uh, the oak tree at the edge of their property. So that's all I wanted to talk about today. Sand lots growing up. Did you have any, um, drop me a line, a uh, comment on, on YouTube or shoot me a, a, uh, a Twitter reply. Um, let me know if you had any sand lot memories. So, uh, tomorrow I think I'll talk about the stack sales because I did have that on the board for today. Um, so I'll talk about stack sales and comparing, uh, stacks to, uh, to eBay sales and why I choose the latter in, in eBay, as opposed to selling directly on Twitter and Facebook to avoid fees. Um, so thanks for, for tuning in again. 1 million Cubs project count is, uh, uh, counted up to 477,084 Cubs with um, a few boxes still unaccounted for. Um, need to count those out. I did did count out about 3,000 cards last night, so um, starting to chip away at uh, at those those mail days. Um, so hey, have a great Tuesday, and as always, uh, follow along on Twitter at One Million Cubs and visit the website One Million Cubs. Dot com. Thanks for tuning in and have a great Tuesday.